finish. That's so valuable. Very cool. Um, my bad, my bad. I'm sorry. So I've been giving this soliloquy and no one's heard it. For, fortunately, Danica was at the office of hours earlier today and I talked with her about the document that I described. Um, okay, so what I was saying is the course um, is now turning to the third of three introductions of methods with age-based modeling, where we're also embarking on a whole new module of this course involving sustained coverage of age-based modeling. Um, so we're taking this up and this will be the first of three methods of these three methods we go through in some depth, okay? Um, this is the first year I've done age-based modeling first. Normally I do system dynamics first, um, but I decided to shake things up and uh, because most projects in this class historically use agent-based modeling, um, I figured that it would be valuable for students to get uh, exposure more systematically to agent-based modeling early and to get some exposure to building agent-based models early. Um, so, we're in Barcelona. Now, um, today, we're going to be talking about that video I asked you to watch. But to make it more concrete, I posted a model to the course site, Canvas site. Yeah. And I'd like you folks to go open it up. Um, uh, this this model is uh, it's one called SEIRS Mobility with contact venues, okay? Um, and uh, this model is actually the fine handiwork, uh, probably a couple hours of work, uh, only a way here. Um, as uh, I think Bernoulli said of Newton, one recognizes the lion by his claw. And uh, Wade, Wade built up this uh, in, in quick order. Um, uh, as an illustration model for this for this class. Um, we're going to be using this model to talk through some of the concepts that you've encountered in the video. And uh, hopefully in the process, we'll be thinking a little bit more deeply about what these concepts really mean when applied to actual models. Okay, so in the uh, in the um, slides associated with this, um, I covered many uh, bits of material, um, but I noted that, uh, yes, wait, oh, thanks, wow, this is like a comedy of errors, okay, um, thank you so much. So I noted that age based modeling is the technique that seeks to understand behavior of a complex system, behavior of one of these systems where the whole is greater than some of its parts, through a particular lens. And this lens involves agent, agent, and agent environment, often reciprocal itself, uh, interaction. So cases where agents are interacting with each other, agents are interacting with the environment, potentially affecting and being affected by it, and it's a bottom sort of upwards facing technique in the sense that by characterizing this, we see behavior induced globally, sort of more broadly across the system by virtue of these lower level interactions. Um, so it, it sort of boils up to lead to behavior up there. Sometimes it's called bottom up modeling. But I tend to be hesitant about that term because the world doesn't have a really nicely well-defined bottom. <laughs> and we'll find that there's plenty of agent-based models which have very different levels of detail capture. So if you're dealing with people, if you're dealing with health issues, if you're to throw out one thing, you might have some models where, you know, they might limit it to talk about whether a person has a health issue or not. Others simulate the dynamics of the health issues. Others might simulate the dynamics of the immune system within a person. 
or dynamics associated with glucose and insulin interacting as they relate to diabetes. And so the idea that we're talking bottom up can can present challenges if it's if it's used too glibly. We have models where we've gone down to level of genetic factors, kind of bioinformatics level concerns, where we have interactions of genes and genes with drugs, et cetera, for antimicrobial resistance. So what I prefer to say is it's upward facing. We see we see behavior generated um, from the model. And these models, like many models, can go from something very stylized, where we have just a few, few rules in it. They give rise often to really interesting and provocative, thought-provoking, and often surprising behavior. The things which are instead empirically grounded, which have lots of components captured in them, and which where the assumptions about those are based on observed data from the world. A lot of statements here. Let's go run a model. Let's go see a model. Let's go run it so that we can get get real about some of these concepts. So uh, this here is a model. If you go to main, we, we see uh, Canvas. And we see that there's some capacity here to sort of display some of the dynamics in these, uh, in these graphs. Uh, but within this model, it's not just this main environment that we use like for this dynamics is kind of the, the place we did all our modeling. There's actually a set of particular agents there. Um, there's places, there's schools, there's workplaces, there's persons and places in the community homes. Let's go drill down to person. Double click on person. And what we'll see here for a person is a language uh, used to characterize the state, actions that change state and rules governing those actions uh, within agents. And we'll see actually there's several state charts characterized here, some related to infection, some related to disability, and this one uh, over on the right related to whether a person is in isolation or not for, for a communicable disease. And we also see some attributes of those individuals, um, which are different, which are represented as any logic parameters, hence these little icons of the sort we saw during System dynamics, for example, but which are they're not 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 merely numbers. Home. Anyone have a sense? What what do you think home represents there? Location. Yeah, it's the location of their home, and it's associated with an agent that is of type home. Similarly, there is a workplace. That's their workplace, right? Or for their children in the school. And then there are some that, for example, are here it's a bully, and that's for false. Are they working from home, for example, or not? Um so here we have individuals. Uh they are they have some state, their state evolves over time, uh, according to actions actions whose process of proceeding is governed by rules. So, so we have state, we have actions, that's the fact that there is a transition from that state from susceptible to exposed is telling us that if an agent is in the susceptible state now, then they could change to become in the exposed state. That's the action, but whether or not that action occurs or under what conditions it occurs is a matter of the rule associated with it. And in this case, it's a message transition. It will occur if that agent receives a certain type of message as, um, as, as suggested by this icon. Um, so if they received an exposed message, they will proceed from here to here. Mm -hmm. 
terms of the rules associated with it. Um, state actions rules, but these these agents are not solitudes. Um, for example, they are bound to places. Um, and uh, here, you'll notice that this link here is uh, is indicating their their current uh, current place, um, and uh, you notice it, it, it links up this agent with a certain place. So agents are placed uh, in an environment where they can be in a uh, in a school, or they could be in a workplace, or they could be home, or they could be in the community. And you'll notice there's also this thing called connection, which actually, by contrast, connects them up. Well, it's given generically with other agents, but it could be with other people, for example. And in many models, work those networks. All of these are aspects, ladies and gentlemen, of the environment. We're, we're having these agents. They're not atomistic. They're not just evolving independently of each other. They're in a kind of silicon society. And they are evolving by interacting with other agents. So hence this agent, agent, and agent environment interaction. Uh, and by virtue of this, uh, they'll be evolving. They'll interact with these workplaces um, or these homes or these schools, um, which are, are, are characterized in a, in a very uh, stylized way. And a model like this induces behavior at the higher level if we run it. So that again is a enactable theory, theory specified at a level that it can be enacted. And if we actually run this model, and I'll speed it up uh, here, you'll notice a certain, certain pulsing evolution of it. So individuals spend their time divided between the homes, these sort of blue, uh, blue, blue um, uh, icon, and and then during the day they go either to the workplace. They're still in a sort of factory type, a factory inspired image, or they'll go to school, which are depicted. Uh, I think I don't know the the yellow. Yes, yeah. um, the first um. Not fully uh, appreciative of our collegiate architects of Canada, but um, are, are are capturing some components of that. And then the community is, if I'm not mistaken, illustrated with the with the green. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have people circulating in these different environments, and by virtue of circulating in these different environments, they have contact with different types of people. So a person who started infected, for example, might then spread infection to others who is co-located with them in that same environment, right? And, um, and as a result, there's an opportunity for that infection to spread. And we can see the number of systematic individuals, for example, so they're very small. It rose up, it reached the peak, and you know, the number of recovered individuals is, is still rising, uh, although um, uh, at a very, very great. Um, and we also see a report of the number of new infections for a given period of time. Um, and uh, this model is characterizing dynamics of infection spread that might remind you a little bit of that system dynamics model, but it's characterizing in a much more textured way, involving spread at different venues, etc. Okay, so uh, this is this is a model, and you may notice that some of the reasoning you develop there holds at the level of the things they talk. For example, you'll notice the number of symptomatic individuals. Those are the red here. Under what conditions will the number of symptomatic individuals rise? Anyone? 
So symptomatic individuals are here, for example. Under what situations would that rise? Anyone? Yes, Erdogan. Okay, so, so that'll be a component of it. But when will it be going up? Okay, when asymptomatic decreases, I yeah, used to say, okay, it goes up when, when this is going down. Well, if it's going up, right? Okay, um, so, so this is true, but I'm, I'm looking for something else that we went over a lot with system dynamics. Yes. Uh, susceptible. Yeah. Okay. So it's a relationship of inflow and outflow. Maybe it's a little bit easier to see with something like exposed, right? That it's mostly going up when the inflow is greater than the outflow. But the inflow here is not at an individual level, right? It's a sum up across many individuals, right? So if we Total up across the population. How many people are getting infected? Essentially, on, on that initial graph here. Um, and how many people are going on from this exposed state, the state of being infected, but not yet infected, but not yet able to spread it? Going on, if we total that up across the population, the number that will be coming exposed. For a given day, and we total up the number that went on across that day, left the exposed state and went to the infected state, we would find that it's the difference between those two that governs whether the number of exposed people is rising or falling, right? If there's more people coming in here across the population than are leaving, then the number of people in the exposed state will be going what? going up. If the number leaving is greater than the number coming in per day, it will be going yeah. down. Yeah. But each individual here is in one particular state at any given time. If we go to the population, we can actually go see, how did I do that? I went over to this developer panel, right? I went and I chose here. I'll go and I'll do it again. Um, I chose the population. And I could look, okay, this person is in the recovered state, for example. This other person is in the susceptible state. You could see it highlighted in red. This other person yet is in the recovered state as well. So, reasoning with stocks and flows apply to this model. But at an aggregated level, at a level higher than it's formulated, this model is formulated, it's specified, it's characterized at a lower level than most system dynamics models, which are which have historically tended to be more aggregate. Now we'll see a departure from that later in the class, where we might have system dynamics within an agent, for example. But here we are dealing with a level of characterization where we can use stock and flow reasoning, not at an individual level for a particular person so much, but to reason about the behavior of the system as a whole. And if these curves from this uh, remind you, whoa, remind you of the dynamics you might see of the system dynamics model with, with good reason, because this model induces as a bottom-up factor, it induces this behavior, which will have some characteristics like those you might see in a higher level system dynamics model. So looking at this graph, there should be some features of it, which are different from what you would expect with a system mining Can anyone comment? Like, what, what's something, if you look at that graph, what's something that you see there that looks different from what we see in system dynamics? 
models of the sort we've seen. Yes, or what? I really think it has a specific specific model, but um, these two models, then you didn't have that much change. You didn't see that uh, everything, the number of susceptible or maybe people who are now recovered uh, recover goes up on the top and it will be 100%, okay. Okay, but the number of susceptible would be down, down to zero. So now I'm you know, seeing that it's not exactly kind of a direct relationship between direct relationship that said okay if that goes up that would be zero no we still have that yeah so, so this will depend um on model structure and there's no shortage of agent based models where one might go up to one and the other goes to zero for example this particular one doesn't but there's something else about these curves that looks different yes tim there's a lot more noise there's stochastic. There's there's indicate or results of stochastic. There's indications of randomness here. And in fact, if you were to run this model again with different random number assumptions, you'll see something a bit different. Let's do that if we could. So I would note that this, you know, starts, it goes peaks about uh probably it's about January 16th or so. It starts going up again and, and around March, I don't know, March 6th or something. Um, there's kind of a little peak here right after that. Let's go run this. But first, we have to make sure that this model is going to yield different results each time we run it. So let's go to baseline. Let's go to the 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 uh, the intervention, or excuse me, the scenario we're going to look at. And you'll notice that in that scenario, down under randomness, per to form, weight, weight is anticipated that already this should be a scenario where if we run at different times, each time it'll run with a different random number sequence. When we run simulation models that involve stochastic, that involve randomness over time, or even randomness at the initial time, without stochastic, the kind of random initial state. For the sake of reproducibility, we want to specify either that each time we run it, we want to run it with the same exact fully re reducible random number sequence, that's the fixed C, or we can do so with a random C. Now that may sound paradoxical, you want your random numbers to be generated with a random seed. But it actually is just referring to the starting sequence will be gained from something that essentially we can treat as, as quite random. Um, and if we run with the same fixed seed, every time we'll get exactly the same dynamics as long as we run it with the same assumptions, same effect model, same data being used for Random seed will be separate. So it will be different. So let's go run it again with random seed here, if we could. So we're going to run this. And as Tim comments, there's stochastics over time. Let's go run this thing here. And I'm going to speed this up further. You notice it peaks a, a little bit differently than before. The timing is slightly later. It's a little bit more peak, but for overall, a lot of similarities. It doesn't actually head up until a little bit later. And, you know, the dif there's differences in the exact timing of the twists and turns of it because they're stochastics. And where would those stochastics be? Can anyone highlight to me anything that might be? Better fans events here. We actually saw this in our first model. And so I, I talked about it before, and some people may remember. Where is an element of chance? Chance of response. Okay. Um, who they exposed? Yeah. So it turns out who, who um, if someone's infected and they expose another person. Let's go to infective. Let's go see this, which represents them exposing another person with a certain contact rate per day. This is a rate transition. 
it actually is indicating a, a memoryless transition where with a certain rate lambda, the, the Poisson process is a certain rate lambda, a two per day, or four per day, or what have you. And, and with that probability density, that hazard rate, we will undertake this. And so on some days, maybe you know it's both two people. Other days, maybe you know it's both one, some not at all, some four. Um, and then if if it does fire, if they are in a certain place, will deliver to the people inside that place, will deliver to a random person an exposed message. So if that random person is susceptible, what will happen by them getting exposed? We saw it earlier. Anyone? Yeah, they may get infected. That's what this was, right? So they send it to someone who happens to be susceptible in that venue, that person will get exposed. But if that person is not susceptible, there's no, if they're already exposed, there's no message transition from that. So it won't, it won't cause them to get exposed. There's no message transition from that. So I'll miss the chance about you know, how many people they're exposing like on a per day basis, who those people are, and you know, well, whether those people are already affected. So all of those are elements of change, but there's more as well. How quickly they go from exposed to infected, how quickly they recover from infected. It's governed by a certain rate, but it's a memoryless transition um, that occurs at that rate, and its time spent infected will therefore be distributed uh, according to what's called an exponential distribution. So the probability of staying infected will decline here as P to the minus alpha T, where P is given by this one over mean time for recovery of days. Or equally well, we could express this as e to the minus t over tau, where here this is the mean time to recover the days. So in short, they are governed by a set of stochastic factors, a set of factors that lead to randomness over time. The timing with which they go down this position will be drawn from this distribution. This is um, the, the probability of remaining uh, in remaining in this case, we'll say this method after that amount of time. Um, we'll, we'll draw from that distribution. And, and that will govern exactly what the transition is. Mr. Zatati. Yes. Uh, so am I correct to assume that in every stage of that graph or any moment of randomness continues? No. So this graph is characterizing the probability distribution for how long they will remain in the state. Right? Um, and what this probability distribution reflects is a fixed chance. We'll be going over the math of this uh, later, but I'm, I'm introducing this idea a fixed chance over time. No matter how long they remain in the state, if they remain in the state, um, so this is time, time has been in state. Okay, um, no matter how long they remain in that state, if they are still there, if it's not still being there, there's the same chance for you to find that they will leave that state. Okay? This is how long they'll remain um, 
uh, in fact, is um, before leaving. That's what this lower place is. This one is probability uh, of leaving um, in the next day of leaving um, state in the next day. Okay. Um, in next day. Um, so so it's been probably like this uh this is the next this is probably like this now oh yeah um so in short they have the same kick at the camp the same chance per day of leaving and that's given by this over here one over that so this is some number right maybe it's maybe it's 0.05 i would mean a five percent chance per day that they will recover, no matter how long they've been there. If they're still in that state, they'll have a five percent chance for the next day. That's why I say it's memory. Doesn't matter how long they've been there, they will leave with that chance. So, when you were asking, is it true there's randomness all along? Well, it's certainly true that um, that randomness will govern when they leave. You know, it's not like at some point they're beyond that chance of leaving, but this curve is not reflecting sort of showing directly somehow randomness. This curve is characterizing how long they will remain in the in the in the, in the state effective before leaving. This describes how what's the chance of leaving in the next day given that they're still in that state, which is fixed. And that's why I say it's normally going to so. This yields this, it turns out, and we'll be talking about that more. But basically, when they come into the state, it's going to draw from this distribution to figure out, I'm sorry, how, how, how long it'll be until they leave. That's what's going to happen. So when they come into the state, um, it's going to figure out they'll be leaving 2.6 days from now, and it will preset for that. Um, so I've got two questions here. So one is common. Um, is mean time for recovery a constant? Mean time for recovery is is a constant here. It's uh, if you go look at main. Notice it says main mean time for recovery. And if you go look at main, if we go down main, um, we'll see that there's a set of parameters, and one of them is called mean time to recovery in days and if we go to main we'll find it well laid out it's a constant right oh so like because the rate is a constant so um they have the same uh yeah so it's, it's a constant so it's not changing over time it's a good question and so that's why this is fixed no matter how long they've been there if they are still there their chance of leaving my next day will be the same and I'll be with you just as I can do. But um, one point here is that um, there's many situations where that's a reasonable thing to assume. And then there are some where that's not the case. For example, if you're dealing with someone who's quit smoking, um, and you consider their chance of falling back into smoking on a per day basis. For their first day of having quit smoking, they're actually a lot more likely to start smoking again the next day than if they stay quit for three years, the chance of they'll fall back into smoking in the next day is very low. Um, so there's a there are quite a few processes in the world um, where this is not a fixed quantity, in other words. Our chance of something happening in the next day, given that we have and it hasn't happened now, is not fixed. There, there's quite a few processes where that's the case, but there's others where it pretty much is the case. This is called memory list. Okay, memory list. It's memory list because we don't have to remember, um, remember how long they've been in the state. It's the same value no matter how long they've been in the state. And it turns out that leads to this. That leads to this certain probability of, of of remaining until time t that they'll 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 stay there until time t. It induces uh, this. This is called the exponential. 
Okay, so if you have a fixed, a memoryless transition, the same can't for you that kind of a blue um, it turns out how long it will be until you leave is given by an exponential distribution. Where this alpha is the value of this. This is the value of this is alpha. Okay. Um that's the same, same alpha here. So it's so if it's a five percent chance per day, this goes down as minus 0 0.05 times t. If this is a 10% chance per day, this goes down as e to the minus 0.1%. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um, good question. Good question. So, in models, the term randomness can be used kind of loosely. And I'd like to distinguish between randomness that is not over time and randomness that is over time. There are certain types of randomness in the model that isn't stochastic. It isn't chance over time. It's rather, say, chance at the initial time. And there is an element at the initial time here um, uh, associated with, with randomness. So if we look at the initial population here, um, and actually, I, I may be wrong, depending on how we, we did this. Yes, I'm correct. Um, I... I inferred uh, way topics. Um, so he drawn for a given person. He drew their home from a from a set of homes randomly. He, he picked with equal likelihood one of the homes. Um, same thing. He picked the workplace. Uh, no, no, excuse me. Um, he picked. Uh, uh, yeah, I picked a, a random uh, workplace in school. I'd have to check, um, but I, I thought the school was based on the nearest school. So um, let's see, let's, let's go take a look here uh, and get random workplace in whole, a school. Um, oh, I see. Okay, so basically he, um, yes, he, he, Drew a um, okay. That that's that's interesting. Okay, right. So basically, uh, oh, they, okay. This is interesting. Wow, that's um, that's quite some logic. Uh, I think the basic gist is that uh, it's drawn randomly, but he did it with some finesse in order to accommodate the fact that um, uh, uh, mumble. Okay, wait. So basically, it, it allows people to consider workplaces for adults, right? And also, who would be the students? Okay, yeah. So it, it draws a random index from the size of, of workplaces plus the size of the students. Yeah, oh, I see. Okay, yes. And then it takes, if it's, if it's within the workplace of size, it could get the workplace, otherwise, it's beyond that. I I see this isn't based on age. No. Okay. Okay. So okay. oh, this is this is for the teacher. This is for the teacher. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. You're two steps ahead of me. Not as frequently as the case. Okay. So this is for teachers. This is for adults that he's doing this basically. And he's allowing for some some adults to work at school. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um so, so Mathieu, to back to your question though, um, these are aspects here which are random. We're selecting a random home. We're selecting a random school, or in, including schools as workplaces or, or, or workplaces. And um, those are random, but they're not randomness over time. Um, by contrast, uh, something like like person here, we have stochastic, we have randomness over time here governing how quickly they will recover or how long they'll remain in this latent state before proceeding to a tested state. So I would class those as different. So if you're asking, is there movement random? Well, it's random in, in a sense that 
which school they go to or which workplace they go to um, or you know, which workplace uh, an adult goes to is based on some initial draw randomly. But the exact details of like they're wandering um, you know, from their home to their workplace, that that is not that is, the randomness in that, the fact they take this street versus that one because of traffic, that isn't captured. Um, is the community place, Wade? Um, uh, so so this this model is done with considerable finesse um, uh, as usual, but is the community place uh, to which they go, that's based on a schedule, I think. Um, and is, is that chosen randomly? Yes. Yeah, so they they choose uh, a random community place at which to uh, to which to travel, right? Um, yeah. So here, um, uh, at different times of the day, basically they go to different um, uh, different types of uh, different types of places, and one of them is the possibility of a community place. In which case they'll go to it randomly. So that much is random. I don't know if that's helpful. Day to day, they'll go to a different community venue. Um, and that will bring them in contact with different people who will have to be there, right? And so you'll notice that this model uses locations for the community to induce contact between people. Who bumps into who is a function of mobility in this model. Um and uh and and that is going to induce uh you know chance meetings of people which can spread infection. Uh Ardalan, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, so for uh, is this is vectors counted as random because for example there, there are people who will become exposed but not in the way that they become infected. They often they um they become uh, they they are kind of um you have the infection, mm -hmm. but not in a way that they become sick and so, but they can just move it to other people. Is that part of the randomness? Or well, so those people are characterized here as asymptomatic individuals. Uh, those people are not merely infected, all of these. They are infected, but they don't are not symptomatic. They're not showing signs. And these, you know. This, this poses risks because they can expose others without realizing it themselves, pose risk to others without realizing it themselves without those others realizing it, right? Um, so so those people are, are captured in this particular model, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so we, we have moreover the schedule which governs people's uh, behavior, you'll notice uh, that uh, that there's this higher level phenomena of infection spread, which is governed by these many types of, of agent behavior at a, a lower level. So we have behavior over time, this behavior, and we have parameters specified over here, um, uh, parameters involving assumptions, for example, how long uh, are they symptomatic or how long is it until they recover, et cetera. These parameters encode assumptions. And it turns out that these parameters in a given unit of the model, a given, say, class uh, or, or element of the model, let's say main here, the parameter assumptions for this, for a given unit of the model, are going to be dictated by where that unit is created. So this is a matter of any logic, uh, but for main, the place where main is created is in the scenario. So baseline will specify in the parameters area, the assumptions to be made about the mean recovery time and days or the mean infected time and days. That's because the scenario creates main. It brings the whole model into existence. The whole, the whole environment. By contrast, a person, um, their parameters, uh, such as 
what's their home or what's their workplace, whether they work from home or not. Those are specified where a person is created. And a person is created, in fact, by Maine. So they're created by the surrounding environment. And if you go look at the population here, you will see that um, for each person in the population, it specifies the value for their parameters, specifies their home, specifies their workplace, their school, uh, whether they're a child, et cetera. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, good. Um, this is a model um, that illustrates a lot of features, but we haven't given examined all. The first one we actually get, this is outputs. The model has outputs um, that uh, we may use to characterize the outcomes of the model. You, you see some outputs there. These outputs are different choice. This is actually a per day or per week, uh, wait, uh, per, per, per unit time, a lot of people getting infected. Um, Whereas these specify at a given time the value of some aspect of the model. Um, so in a way, this reflects a flow. This reflects the current state of the model. Um, uh, this is uh, the, and this is the location of exposure. This is these are quantities, accumulative quantities, where where infections have taken place. What is this telling us? Where are infections taking place at this moment? Um, uh, what, what's the sort of relative now? Anyone? Yes, not yet. Home is a big one. Yeah. Um, what's the next runner up for that? Workplace. Work That's right. And school and then school and then the community. That's right. Um, so, so the model is saying, okay, look, if, if this theory, if this theory is a fairly plausible characterization of you know people's daily lives and how they interact, where they spend time, the balance of the time they're spending at home and work and, and school, so on, um, many veterans. This would be kind of what you might expect in terms of where the contact takes place. Right? Um, that's something that's very hard to actually report in the world. I mean, some of our work with smartphone based data collection gives us some clue about where these infections take place. But but this is this is type of data that's very hard to get from the world where infections are taking place. Right? Um, even if people are infected, they often won't know for several days and they won't know where they picked it up. They might guess, right? Oh, my coworker had sniffled two days ago, or my sister had picked up with COVID, you know, last week. But often they don't know. And this gives us some basis for starting to hypothesize, you know, what might the balance be of where people are getting affected, for example. Um, the model doesn't have to be perfect to sort of characterize this roughly, um, but it has to be a little bit plausible, right? Um, and we could, of course, vary model assumptions and see the degree to which this would uh, would change. Um, now, beyond this, though, um, we've been running the baseline, and one of the biggest uses of the model, of course, is to serve as what it is. And again, to serve effectively is what if those we we want to be sure that our model captures causality, sort of what we cause it to what to influence what, right? We capture that in our model. We capture, you know, how infection progresses or or the ways in which people move from home um, to other venues during the day, like we've got a workplace and school. We can ask what if closed. So here, for example, we could say, well, what if we close schools, right? Um, uh, and and we could say, okay, how would that change? What's you know what results from the model? Uh, and we could examine. 
Um, so by running this model with with schools closed, no one going to school. You notice these these yellow schools aren't growing during the day. No one's going to them. Kids are staying at home. But you do notice that parents at least are going still to workplaces. So they're doesn't look like they're they're staying home with their kids. What happened here? Can anyone say? What what happened? Okay, all the effects were from home. How many of them were there? Yes. Uh Alex. Uh, so I'm just assuming that the house starts to bed you infect one random person. Yeah. It seems like one person got sick and they got better and no one person got sick and it didn't spread. Now model is stochastic, right? Um so let's go run this again. And you know, presumably this uh also is one where we have uh everything generated from a random number. Um in other words, we're gonna have different random number sequences each time. So I'm running it here and we'll run it quickly. And this time we actually see something rather different. Qualitatively different, right? The previous one, there's no outbreaks. This one, there is an outbreak. Um, but the outbreak induces different impact. Does anyone remember? How does this how does this symptomatic um uh this the the timing of this symptomatic one differ from before from the where we saw the peak before peak was actually a little bit earlier why would that be before because the presence of schools might accelerate some of the ability to spread yeah. How does it change the balance of of uh, where infections take place? Well, home is still once again the number one one, right? And now we have work to think maybe the fourth school don't occur. But there are we should really pay a little bit of additional attention to this. You notice now by the, the end of the time home is about nine hundred. 900 of the infections took place at home. If we had looked at the baseline and we had run it, um, we we might have seen uh, a somewhat different number at the final time. Yeah, so it's under 800. So in a way, we've, we've kept kids at home, but some of the infections, with them spending more time at home, more infections are occurring at home. But we did see for that one intervention, for that one time, that it did not spread, right? And if we ran it again, we could once again see, you know, sometimes it, it spreads and sometimes it doesn't. What this is cluing us into is, I need to be really careful. We need to not just run it once, not just run it twice, but to be systematic about it. And in general, with age-based models, Stochastics are really important. We're dealing with individual human behavior. The vagaries of how long someone stays sick. The vagaries of who they contact with, with effect, you know, in terms of risk of study infection, in terms of their movement patterns. It behooves us to take, to, to take serious account of that randomness by running the model of what's called an ensemble of realization. What I mean by that is running it, say, for 50 times or 100 times and seeing the results. Sometimes you may need more than that. But what we've seen at just three times running the first where it didn't take off, these two where it did, you know, uh, there, there is some chance there at the not least that it won't spread. And if we run a large enough ensemble, we could start to bring some degree of confidence as to what things are regularities when it does take off, and what fraction of times does it take off versus does it not. 
Um, and some folks here may remember, you know, from your statistics courses, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later in the, in the course, that the more times you run it, for example, the more confident you can be to narrow your confidence interval around your estimate of the fraction of time that you're going to take off. And if you want to narrow that by factor of two, you have to multiply by four the number of times you run. Um, so, so we're dealing with stochastic today. We're dealing with a stochastic situation. But we're also dealing with regularities that are undeniable. Each time it's not totally randomly different, but it falls into a certain broad path. Certain there's a certain orderliness to it. If it takes off, it looks like a lot of the time when we close schools, we're going to something like 900 ish people affected at home, which was more than it was for the baby. Let's go run some more of them. This, this is a model that allows us to look at quite fine grain interventions. Closing schools is one of them. We could also look at, for example, a variant of that where we, where if schools are starting to have an outbreak, we could immunize kids at the schools. In this ORI 10, the 10 is, is so what? It's, it's not an outbreak response. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Once it detects an outbreak, it will close the school. It won't perform immunization. It's outbreak response uh, intervention. So yeah. ORI can mean outbreak response immunization, as Wade knows from past work. But um, but this in this case is more an intervention strategy. So schools are closed in the event of an outbreak at at uh, that particular school or at any school. In the community. In the community. Okay. Um, so we could run that. We, we could have schools open most of the time, but then we shut them down if there's a if there's an outbreak. And here there is an outbreak, right? Um, um so it, it'll be a contingent intervention, a conditional intervention, which is more um, which which has more texture to it. If there's no outbreak that really occurs. Um, we won't shut schools down and and which will allow more people to to go to to go to workplaces and work in the real world, although I don't think that characterizes yet. I, there's no impact on adults of no workplaces. Um, yeah. Um, right. Okay. So another thing we could look at in a model like this is what if uh what if symptomatics isolate? Um and this is what 50% of symptomatics versus 100%. Suppose, suppose symptomatic individuals were asked to isolate. I don't think I have to ask you to imagine that, right? Yeah. Oh, oh my God. Uh, hopefully, please tell me I don't have to imagine it. Um, okay, so imagine if 100% compliance we have for that. So 100% of those who are symptomatic isolate. I'm going to run it, but I'm not going to look at the results. You tell me. Do you think that's going to stop the infection? Yes. Or why not? Sorry? Oh, uh, stop or slow. Okay, that's right. So why might it, why might it stop? Anyone give me a, a Okay. So the idea is, look, if we get infected people to isolate, they're not going to be able to infect their workplace, their schoolmates. But are there some people that they could infect still? Matthew? Right, exactly. So there's asymptomatic individuals, people who haven't become symptomatic yet. So they're still pretty good at home, right? And those people at home might not be isolating themselves. So they might spread it to them at night, but then during work, the people at home go to the schools and work and they bring it to the schools and workplaces. They caught it from home. And what I heard earlier is that some of the infected, while still infected, are 
in a position where they are asymptomatic. So they could still be spreading it. They're not just symptomatic, right? I mean, so uh, Ardalan. There is another way that they uh, would get to do that. I mean, they could just sleep slow, but it will happen because even though we minimize it as much as possible, it doesn't mean we stop it 100% because even if they, we have no symptoms and any of that, uh, people will still get it. I mean, it depends on the disease. Like, is it, is it going to be moved air to air? By the environment, by hunting, by handshaking, the yep. and stuff. I think That's it's right. not just going to be depending on the if, the if we are going to happen in the society. Many of those people are sure, sure. So yeah, and so remember, these models are not designed to look at all possible conditions. This is one model. It's designed with certain broad assumptions. You are right that. For certain particularly highly transmissible subvariants of of uh, Omicron, um, uh, airborne spread uh, occurs between apartments. It can occur via central air systems. It can occur in some cases via piping, etc. And and there are cases of people getting infected via that without, in fact. Even if they're isolating, they can they can spread it. Um, we are not aiming the model for that. So um, uh, you know, it's 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 a good comment, but you have to recognize models are built for certain types of situations and not for others. Just like that map of Saskatoon that you use for driving is very different from the map you use for you know figure out what bus to take to the airport. Yeah. Um. So what? Do we see though? It didn't did it stop the infection? No. What change did it do? Anyone? Yeah, so there's seems to be quite a few, quite quite a lesson of how many that have occurred in school workplaces too. And how about for homes? Well, it went up here to about 800, which is similar to what we saw for the eight five. Yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, it, it does, uh, does flatten out. The numbers that are recovered seem to be a little bit smaller, and, and, and uh, it then, of course, uh, declines here. Now, we could, of course, take this into account better. How about 50% compliance? What do you think we'd see there? Yes. Then we have a uh, typical bias that like, it means that we will, we will be we least compared to the original one, but we, it will be to the base much one. more compared to the 100 one because there right. are less people who will buy so Okay. So, the so by and large, that's, that's, that's true. So, we're getting less isolation and it'll end up spreading to. So much more people. We we do know that in this case it was actually fairly successful. I mean, the number of people affected at home, for example, is up there um somewhere around uh, 750. Um uh the number recover goes up to uh still about 800. But yes, if we ran it again and again, we'd expect to find it um uh, find it lower. Now the final thing we'll run is this uh this uh intervention that includes multiple types of things. So here we are we are basically isolating people who are symptomatic and closing schools and what else Wade? And some work from home and other places. Okay. So now uh was this uh so I just ran that compared to the baseline uh compared to that first word of the man uh how would you describe that? Okay, so so uh, school and community, you can't even see them on that on that chart. Good. And so that suggests no spread and and uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's gone down to something like 800 to something like 135 or something like that. Oh, oh. Um, 
number of infections is markedly lower per day um, than are occurring. And, uh, you know, the number of uh, exposed people is the number of recovered people. The number of recovered peaked at like 800 before, but uh, now it's peaking at somewhere around, somewhere below 100, something like that. This had a market impact, right? Um, and, uh, well, um, we could have examined what would it look like if we had only triggered it in the event that the outbreak is discovered. So we, we only trigger it when the outbreak is discovered. Now we have more. Now we could run this, of course. We're, 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 we're doing things kind of fast and loose for the sake of the class here. Well, we could run this several times over and we could have run that last one. But you'll notice that this one tends to still have some infection. Why is that? What, what, what happens to you? It only triggers this when an outbreak was evident. Yes. Oh, there's, 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 yeah, so so it's already started to spread. Now it does reduce the size, right? Um, there's fewer people who would be infected at home, for example, at what time um, than otherwise would have done. But it's still a lot. Why? Why would that be? Why would so many people still be infected at home? Okay, so yeah, so until the outbreak is declared. And until this this set of measures come into place, people are circulating. Those people who got infected after the outbreak is declared, where are those people going to be at home? And they're going to be spreading it uh, quite a bit at home. It does bring down markedly the number infected at school, workplace, the community. And it brings this down um, from a peak up there, something around 800 to a peak around 200. Um, but uh, but there's a lot a lot more spread because it's declared so late. Yes. I feel like one reason that the point is so is higher. Yeah. Because perhaps then we then I mean I thought you might say then people are come home, they remove their masks, they uh, remove the social distance and also that is correct. Uh, yeah. And also children tend to be not caring about that kind of stuff. They always come to their parents. So right. it's impossible to actually um, make that change. So maybe that's why they make most of the disease infectious after infectious Good. In the Yeah, although I'm not sure when I discussed the idea of, of, of characterizing that, yeah, but I'm, I'm not in that's not a test case. Um, uh, so, okay, a lot going on with this, but I'm, I'm hoping to that this exercise has helped show you a couple of principles. Um, one thing is that you know, models like this are effective tools for asking texture and what it was. Particularly for this model, because of its lower level of characterization, we have people and homes and community places and schools and workplaces, we can ask fairly fine grained questions, you know. If we were to shut schools, what would the impact be? If we were to have people work from home or possible, what would the impact be? And that was an attribute of a person, sort of whether they can work from home, I guess. Is that right, Wayne? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, can, we can ask questions about triggering these interventions when a certain condition is arrived at. Um, we can ask questions that change people's mobility patterns, uh, who they're spending time with, and, and that's powerful. In all these cases, this finer grained model of all these interactions, people, locations, workplaces, and so on, that leads to higher level behavior of the model as a whole. And the fact that we have all this detail gives us this flexibility for also understanding why we're seeing certain changes for certain strategies. For example, we could see where are people getting infected, when they 
when we have you know schools closed how much does it shift infections taking place at schools versus taking place at home etc this model also i hope will be exposed a little bit to this idea of well, having a reference scenario a baseline which we run as by default. That's kind of often it's our status quo. What's very consistent is it's our reference point. So we have a reference point to which we compare other scenarios, results of other scenarios. So we have a reference, and then we say, what if we did this? What if we did that? And we compare each of them to that baseline. And it sharpens our thinking about what's going on. You know, oh, yes. This does reduce the number of infections, but not for everyone. People are still asymptomatic to get infected, or they're still infecting people at home, et cetera. It helps our mechanistic thinking about the world by having a model sort of to bounce ideas off. As there's some other features. Another feature that, that lasted throughout this that I didn't really, to which I didn't do justice, but we'll be dealing in this planet in substantial amounts is uh is this issue of stochastics and the issue of stochastics is one where we have uncertainty over time in these models and it un induces uncertainty in the result right we get out different results based on different particulars of what's observed in the model Chance events, chance happenstance changes the result. And in order to have any confidence about those results, you ensure they're not flukes, we want to run them out of many times. And sometimes the results, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes those results are matters of degree. But sometimes matters of qualitative difference in behavior. Where do we see a qualitative difference between one run and another for the same scenario, same set of results? Where do we see that? Anyone? Yes. Uh, Tony. One don't have the outbreak, one has the outbreak. Exactly. One had an outbreak and one, ladies and gentlemen, did not. Chance, right? Chance. Good luck in one case, uh, not in the other. And so it behooves us to, to, to draw reliable conclusions to run these models in many times. With enough realizations, we start to develop statistical reliability about the outcome. And if you wondered why, for this class, there's an expectation of exposure to probability theory or exposure to statistics, it's in no small part because when we're dealing with database models, and indeed, the other type of modeling that's often conducted at an individual level, which is what? What other type of the three types is often conducted at an individual level? Uh, it can be, it can be. I don't deny that it can be, but one that's in, almost, that's invariably at an individual level. Entities flowing through workflows, they're individual entities. What is that? Discrete event symbol. When we're dealing with these, we need we need statistical reliability in the results. And we we need to see that the results uh, are yielding reliable patterns that reflect the orderliness in and what's produced by the model. So we we illustrated outputs, population. Actions. I'm oh, sorry, population parameters. Excuse me. We saw states, right? And we saw that a state chart illustrates at once the state in which an agent can be located, the actions that change those states. Yeah, it's better if you take notes rather than do something else. Uh, and the rules that govern those transitions. That's going to be uh, what we package up in a state chart, just like in a stock and flow diagram. 
we had the same the same three things. So in a stock and flow diagram, we illustrate just as in a state chart, three things at once. States, actions. For for these models, the actions are where? Where are the actions? The things that change. Where are they? Where are the actions? Yes, right. Uh, getting stone. Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. So I mean, we could look at actions in any of these state charts, but. But uh, for example, there's an action here. There's, but there's actions here that change states, right? And the rules that they, they govern on that here that specify under what conditions or how much they are taking place in stock and flow. Where were these things? What? Where do we capture states in a stock and flow diagram? In the stocks. Where were actions and rules? They were associated with the flows. They're associated with the flows. The, the, the fact that there's a flow from susceptible to in fact to exposed in our stock and flow diagram means it changes state. And how much it changes state is given by the formula. That's kind of the rule there. Okay. Um, and so we've seen outputs, we've seen parameters, we've seen actions. Rules, state, time, and we've seen interventions, these sort of what if scenarios would change things. So we intervene on the system. Uh, we have uh, outbreak response, uh, intervention of closing schools or having people work from home or what have you. Uh, there's an environment. Here it's a physical environment of the going to schools and workplaces and homes and so on at different times of the day. But it could be a networked environment. And all of those combined yields a very powerful method in HMAS models. And we'll be diving in over coming weeks into how HMAS modeling can be used to build up rich models and, and ask powerful types of questions. Okay. So thank you very much. And I will be posting uh, an exercise for that time.